everyone, and welcome to Protecting the Music You Create. My name is Rosemary Tully. I am an attorney. I focus on entertainment law um, and sort of sub-focus on music and independent film and uh, some unscripted television. So this is being recorded, and I apologize, I might be looking in a variety of different directions along the way. Um, sometimes I'll be looking at uh, uh, the PowerPoint that I have to go along with this, and sometimes I'll be looking at you. So let's get started. Um, when we're talking about protecting the music you create, this is really going to be a discussion about copyright, collaborations, and coordinating the rights to your music. We can't have a discussion about music without understanding copyright. So that's where we're going to start today. So for copyright, generally, um, just sort of an overview. And I have to note that this overview is for copyright in the United States. Uh, copyright, the whole concept of copyright is, is common throughout the world. But uh, every, every country does do things a little bit differently. So this one is just what we're going to talk about today just relates to the United States. So our copyright law is found in Title 17 of something called the United States Code. That's what we would call black letter law or statutes. Um, copyright is a type of intellectual property. Intellectual property is... It's defined as a commercially valuable product of the human intellect. So under intellectual property, you have copyright, you have trademark, you have patents, and you have trade secrets, all words that you've probably heard before. Um, for, for intellectual property, I think it's good to, to think of it as property because that is what it is. Somebody owns it, it's property, somebody owns it, and the somebody who owns it gets paid when someone else uses it or when it is sold. Kind of logical. So let's talk about copyright protection. What's protectable under copyright? So copyright covers original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. What what types of things are we talking about there? So we're talking about literary works, musical works, and that's the that includes the lyrics, dramatic works, pantomimes, chore choreography, pictures, graphics, sculptures, motion pictures, sound recordings, and architectural works. It's important to keep in mind that ideas are not protectable. Only the expression of an original idea is protectable. So that song that you're humming in your head is not protectable until you put it in tangible form. You either write it out or, or you record it. Digital form is, is understood as tangible form. When you have copyright, uh, when you have copyright protection, you get a bundle of rights. That's how people usually refer to it. It's this bundle of rights. You get the right to reproduce the work, which is make copies. You get the right to prepare derivative works, which really means basing a new work on a pre-existing work. You get the right to distribute copies, um, and you get the right to publicly perform the work. We should just note copyright registration and duration. So copyright Copyright attaches, and that's the phrase that people use. Copyright attaches at the moment of creation. So as soon as you take that idea and you put it in tangible form, you express it in tangible form, copyright attaches. But it is always best to formally register your works with the U.S. Copyright Office. And I use the word works. It's, it's cer certainly... Uh, common here in the U.S., we refer to things that are capable of copyright as works. So you'll hear me refer to something that's a copyright or something that's an, a piece of intellectual property as a work. 
Um, so you always want to register your works with the U.S. Copyright Office. The benefits of registration include the ability to collect compulsory mechanical royalties. We'll talk about those later. Um, the ability to file an infringement action. You, you can't file a lawsuit uh, claiming someone infringed your copyright unless you've registered, at least under, under U.S. law, under the federal statute. You can't um, file an infringement action without having first copyrighted your work. And then the benefit of copywriting is you get to recover something called statutory damages. Damages are money um, and attorney's fees, which is kind of neat, too. So registration is very, very easy. I'd like to point out the Copyright Office, copyright.gov, has an excellent website um, full of great information. They've really worked hard at getting the right information out there. So it's worth a visit. Uh, it's probably more than you want to know, but it is worth a visit. Um, copyright duration, duration, since we're talking uh, about these things uh, in the U.S., current copyright duration is um, life of the author plus 70 years. If there's more than one author, it's the life of the last author to die plus 70 years. And then works made for hire, that copyright is uh, 95 years from first publication or 120 years from creation. We will touch on works made for hire later on. Okay, so today we're focusing on music. So we've got musical compositions. We're going to start with that. Musical compositions are protected by copyright. What is a musical composition? Well, it's probably very obvious, but we're talking about lyrics and melody, poetry and rhythm. I guess it could be defined a whole bunch of different ways, a sequence of notes and chords. But again, we go back to our copyright law definition, an original work of authorship, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. The key, it's so many times, the key in, in, in copyright and particularly copyright claims is what's original. What's original so that it's protectable by copyright. I wish I could give you clear cut information and everything black and white, but it just doesn't exist that way. So what is original is debatable. You probably have heard of the Blurred Lines case, um, a situation where the song Blurred Lines was released by Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke. They created it. It was released in 2013. And the estate of Marvin Gaye, who, who was a very popular um, music artist, uh, the estate of Marvin Gaye sued uh, Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke, saying that their song Blurred Lines infringed, copied uh, the music of Marvin Gaye and his song, Gotta Give It Up. Um, interestingly here, when you listen to both songs, you may not feel that they're, they're similar to each other and that there was some sort of copying. Uh, and the, the, there was a lot of debate about that, certainly in this case. Um, there were expert musicologists who determined that there were similarities between the two works, but the whole case really seems to at least feel to, to, to be uh, a taking of the feel or the groove of the Marvin Gaye song rather than, than really copying the melody or any other um, uh, musical aspect of the song. So this in this situation, Marvin Gaye's estate won. Um, copyright infringement was found. And uh, not to sound too corny, but the blurred lines case left lines very blurred for us. Um, do you have to worry now that if you copy the feel or the groove or, or that the, the move of the song, are you going to be accused of copyright infringement? Um, we next have a, a more recent case, which is the Katy Perry Dark Horse case, where Katy Perry's song Dark Horse um, was at issue and compared to another song called Joyful Noise. And the claim there was, was about something called an ostinato. Now, I am not a musician, but it's, I understand it to be a repeated musical feature. So here, the court is saying, that um, there were, these were basic music features. 
that the joyful noise song had and and basic music features the building blocks of a musical composition um nobody gets sort of a monopoly on that so the court said that the the ostinato that was repeated uh from joyful noise into dark horse um, is not really protectable it's not original enough um it lacks the court says it lacks the quantum of originality needed to merit copyright protection so dark horse tells us that you know what there are certain um uh pitch progressions um played in a certain rhythm that everyone's entitled to you can't get a lock on that um and claim that someone's infringing so the katy perry dark horse case um clears it up a little bit in that area and allows uh, allows everybody to use the building blocks of music. It doesn't mean you can sample something and use it. That's a that's a different animal and we'll talk about that later. Okay, the important thing and you may or may not already know this, but I think we have to play it out because it matters and you we need to understand a little bit uh of the distinction between the music copyrights. There are two music copyrights. Every song has two copyrights. It has the underlying composition, which we'll often refer to as the composition, which is the words and the music. That's one copyright. The second copyright is the sound recording. For each of these copyrights, we have the typical bundle of rights that we talked about early on, uh, reproduction, derivative work, right to distribute, and public performance. Each of these copyrights has those bundle of rights. The tricky part is the sound recording in the public performance rights area. Those rights are a little bit limited, but not so for the composition. I like to look at the music copyrights as, as two circles. Sometimes a visual is helpful. So for music copyrights, we have the underlying composition, also referred to as the composition. That's the music and lyrics. And the sound recording is the second copyright. And that copyright, the sound recording is the recording embodying the first copyright, the composition. It's in copyright, it's it's always important to understand who the author is. Now, at the beginning of this discussion, we said the author is the person who takes the idea, hopefully, and um writes it out or puts it in some sort, fixes it in some sort of tangible form so that other people can perceive it. So who is the author? Well, generally it's understood that the author, certainly of a musical composition, is the person or persons who wrote the music and lyrics. Okay, that's easy. Um, for sound recording, it's a little, it could get a little bit more complicated and we'll talk about that later on. Um, we need to consider joint authors. What if there's more than one author? Uh, both authors or all five authors, all the authors, all the people who created the particular composition are joint authors. So, a, so you find that often in a collaboration situation. So the joint authors all are owners of the particular song. Uh, work made for hire. That's when you have a situation, it's either an employer-employee relationship or a hiring party and an independent contractor relationship. Works made for hire are different. When you have a work made for hire situation, the person creating the music is not the author, even though they're the one that created it. If you have a true work for hire, the hiring party or the employer is the author and the owner of the copyright. That makes a big difference. So if I am a graphics artist and I am employed by a graphics company, that's an employer-employee relationship, even though I create the graphic art, I am not considered to be the author. My employer is the author and owns the copyright as author and as copyright owner um, as a work made for hire. Uh, I also want to touch on what an assignment is. So you can have a situation where, let's say I'm an independent graphic artist and I've created uh, an image 
and somebody wants to buy the image from me and they want to own all the copyright rights to that image, well, one way I can make that transfer is to sell it or assign it over to the person who wants to buy it. I, I will note that you can assign the entire copyright. You can assign only portions of a copyright. Very often when you have a situation where a film is based on a novel, the author of the novel will only sell or assign the rights to a movie production company to make the film and the owner will retain all the other rights. So assignment, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a nice way to sell some or all of your, the interest in your copyright. The interesting thing with an assignment is after, generally, after 35 years, the original author may terminate the assignment. That's pretty interesting. So you can get the rights back after 35 years. Okay, again, staying on who is the author, what about artificial intelligence? Can artificial intelligence be an author under US law? The answer at the moment is no. The, there was uh, uh, someone who tried to file a copyright registration uh, naming an artificial intelligence as the author and the register of copyrights refused the registration. The register said um, an author must be a human. Once the Register of Copyrights made that determination, why not? We now have a lawsuit against the Register of Copyrights to challenge that decision. So at the moment, artificial intelligence cannot be an author under U.S. copyright law. But with this lawsuit, we don't know if that's going to change. Okay. So just staying for the moment with who is the author of a musical composition I think it's important to understand that when you're writing in a collaborative setting, it is, it is important to understand who's making what con contribution to the musical work. Um, who's going to own it? You, you want that, and, who, and who's going to own it, and how much of it are they going to, to own? If, the, um, if you have two people coming up with a composition, the music, and and one has added more music than than another well maybe they don't get a full share of that copyright maybe they get some proportionate share often the best way to do this because you're not always going to have the luxury and i would say 99 percent of the time you're not always going to have the luxury or the opportunity to have a lawyer in the room while music's being created nor probably would you want one um so there's nobody there to write out a complete agreement and go through all the issues and, and all the possibilities and put together a four page agreement to memorialize your collaboration. What is helpful is if you do something called a split sheet. A split sheet would include the title of the song or the working title, the date of creation, the names of the authors and their respective percentages. Keep in mind the percentages have to add up to 100. They can't go beyond 100. It's just that's all there is to, to share, 100%. Um, the split sheet would also include the name of the songwriter's publishing company, if they have one, and their performing rights organization, if they're affiliated with one. I have to stress that memorializing the ownership interests at, at the outset with a split sheet or something similar can save you a lot of grief and cost later on if there is a dispute about ownership over the song. It is not fail-proof, but it's better than nothing. Uh, it's, it's, the, the right way to do it is to have a formal collaboration agreement. But we know that may not be practical. Okay, who is the author for a sound recording? So up until now, we've been talking about authors generally and then authors for the sound, uh, the uh, composition. Now we're going to talk about who is the author for the sound recording. There are a variety of people who can contribute to the sound recording. We're going to focus on two for the moment. And generally, if a label is involved, a contract between the recording artist and the record label will state that the sound recording will be owned by the record label as, here's that phrase again, as a work made for hire. They will also have assignment language in there. 
we don't, we're not going to go down that road. There's just not enough. That would be a whole nother two or three sessions to talk about record deals. Um, but in, if a label is a record label is involved and this is not a hundred percent of the time, but most times the record label will want to own the sound recording as a work for hire. Same thing if a producer for the producer, if a record label is involved, the contract with the producer will say that the sound recordings that are made under this contract will be a work made for hire for the label. If no record label is involved, if we think about this for a moment, and we've just, we said early on, all the contributors to a collaboration uh, are owners of the copyright. So if there's no label involved, and you have a variety of people that contributed to a sound recording, then do each of those people have an interest in that sound recording? Well, maybe. Um, so if you're doing things on your own without a record label and it's your music and you're hiring people to perform and you're hiring a producer and you're, you're you know, you're paying for everything. Well, maybe you need some paperwork in place that does what the record labels do and, and notes that either everything's a work for hire or maybe you, you'd want everything to be a work for hire anyway, but maybe the producer gets a piece um, like a royalty in the upside of the success of the song. So again, authorship matters. And, and if you can figure that out early on, it's a big plus. Okay, so we're just gonna talk now, we're gonna go back to the composition copyright. Again, the music and lyrics, and we're going to talk about how that's handled in the music industry. The, I'm sure you've heard the term music publishing. Music publishing is associated with the compensation the composition copyright for the most part. Um, it encompasses a variety of aspects that come under sort of the music publishing umbrella. Um, often in music publishing are the terms writer share and publisher, sh publisher share. Those terms are not a creation of the law. They are a creation of the business of music. Um, so those shares can be fluid in when we're talking about performing rights. They're usually 50-50, writer share, publisher share. It doesn't absolutely have to be that way, but that's usually what it is when we're talking about what a publisher receives when a songwriter signs with a publisher. Could be 50-50, could be a different split. Um, they're still called writer share and publisher share, um, but... The contract that you sign will define what those shares are. Um, so included in music publishing rights are performance rights, mechanicals, and synchronization rights. So again, we're talking about the music and lyrics, and we're going to talk about each of those rights. Performance rights. Performance rights includes the right to, this gets a little technical, but we'll, we'll, uh, will sort of ease into it. Um, the right to authorize non-dramatic performances of the composition over television, radio, and other electronic devices, online transmissions, and non-dramatic live performances. Non-dramatic live performances, sounds very dramatic, um, really means concerts, right? Um, music that you hear on television, radio, other electronic devices, online transmissions, those are all performances. Those are all considered performances of the music. Uh, for example, the song Running Up That Hill, uh, released in way back in 1985. That's getting a good amount of airplay these days because it was featured in the, uh, the show Stranger Things on Netflix, which was pretty cool. Um, the music artist of Running Up That Hill, Kate Bush, wrote and recorded that song. She, and this, this is not the case of most artists. She's a very successful artist. She's been around a long time. She wrote and recorded that song. And I, it's my understanding that she owns both the composition and, and the um, sound recording, which is not often the case. Um, so when that composition gets played on the radio or TV online or through a stream or in a concert, Kate Bush gets paid. She gets paid as the writer of the composition. And again, right now we're talking about the composition. She gets paid as the writer of the composition through her performing rights organization. She's in the UK, so it's a, it's a different 
different than what we would have here. Um, but she gets paid whenever that song is performed. She also gets synchronization fees, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So performing rights is really the public performance of the music. Here in the U.S., we have uh, performing rights organizations. The most familiar ones are ASCAP and BMI. Uh, these were established many years ago to protect the interests of the composers and to provide a central clearinghouse of sorts for the licensing of public performance of musical works. So what do the PROs collect? They usually um, they collect on a variety of public performances. Uh, but one that may be most familiar is they collect license fees from venues where music is played or performed live. Uh, so it's played or performed live, not played live, played live or performed live. It could be a sound recording that they're playing um, in, in sort of a venue, either a bar or um, a concert hall or an arena. Um, so just for an example, if you're out there, if you're a, an artist that performs live and you're out there playing cover songs, uh, technically you need a license from the composers of those songs to publicly perform, perform them. Uh, fortunately for you, the venue will have a license typically from ASCAP and BMI from both PROs. So you are kind of covered. So it's not like you have to go through and license each song that you're performing as a cover. Usually the venue will have something called a blanket license, which means they can play any song in the repertoire of ASCAP or BMI. They'll have a blanket license from, from both of those. Okay, that's public performance. Now we're going to talk about mechanicals or the compulsory mechanical license. The compulsory mechanical license deals with the right to record and reproduce an existing composition to make a sound recording of an existing composition, in essence, to record a cover of another song. Um, generally, in copyright, to use so generally copyright, not just not music, any type of copyright. Generally, in copyright, to use a pre-existing work, you have to get permission from the copyright holder, and the copyright holder can say no; they can refuse. But music being music, it's different. If you just want to re-record an existing song, audio only, um, there is an exception. And that is a license is required, but the composer cannot refuse the license because we have something called a, a compulsory mechanical license under the law. To qualify for a compulsory mechanical license, you have to satisfy this list of elements. Um, the song is not a dramatical work, meaning like an opera or a musical. Um, it has been previously recorded, so it already exists. The previous recording has been distributed publicly, meaning the song has been released out into the world. Um, and the, rec the recording that you make of it, the, when you're re-recording a cover, you can't change the basic melody or the fundamental character of the song. Um, so you, you can only sing it pretty much as is. You can add a little stylistic uh, uh, nuances to it, um, but you can't, and you can probably adjust the arrangement a little bit, but you can't change the song too much. Otherwise you will not be qualifying for a compulsory uh, mechanical license. And again, this is audio only. So for example, if I want to make an audio only recording of Taylor Swift's Shake It Off, I can do so. She can't say no. She and her co-writers and her music publisher cannot refuse me. I do, however, have to obtain a license uh, and I have to pay the something called the statutory mechanical royalty. So for every copy I make, I have to pay Taylor Swift and company 9.1 cents per copy. The license is called a mechanical license and the royalty payments are often called mechanicals. Um, there is a clearinghouse, so like we talked about ASCAP and BMI, there is a clearinghouse in the US for mechanical licensing. You don't have to use it, but many people do, and that's called the Harry Fox Agency. You may or may not have heard of that. Um, arrangements, as I had mentioned before, uh, 
Uh, you really can't change the arrangement too much if you're relying on a mechanical license. Um, and if you do change it somewhat, you don't own that arrangement. So a mechanical license is pretty much says, okay, you have to stay true to the original. You can play around with it a little bit for your arrangement and your style, but those changes that you make to the arrangement, you don't own. Um, I think it's worth saying that you cannot rely on a mechanical license for sampling. So you may be using um, someone else's song and you say, well, I'll just get a mechanical, in a new song that you're creating, you say, I'll just get a mechanical license for that because apparently people can't say no, that doesn't work that way. So, okay. We've talked about public performance rights. We've talked about mechanicals. Now we're going to talk about synchronization. And it seems that everybody's talking about synchronization. Everybody wants to get in on the synchronization money, money train um, because it can be lucrative. Synchronization rights can be lucrative. Uh, synchronization is licensing um, the, the use of music in timed relation to pictures. So an audiovisual work using music. Examples include television or shows being streamed, um, music in film, a music video, a YouTube video, music in video games. All of those have pictures, right? Um, commercials or, or I say I separate commercials out because they can be pretty lucrative. Um, but commercials on TV or a streamer on YouTube. Um, the metaverse, don't forget the metaverse. There's there's music licensing in the metaverse because there are, you, you usually have, if you have music playing in the metaverse, you're usually seeing something with it. It's not just audio. Um, we don't know where licensing in the, in the metaverse is gonna go yet. It's a whole new, whole new frontier, but you still need a sync license to license music in the metaverse. So synchronization license is different from public performance license, what we talked about at the beginning. Um, it's different from a mechanical license. It can make nice money. If you license your songs uh, for synchronization, you can make some nice money, especially if it's a popular song and it's used in a commercial to, to market a product. Um, you have to know that the synchronization license can be refused. The composer, the owner of the copyright, does, or you know, it's either the composer or the composer's um, music publishing company that will own or control the the copyright to the particular song that you might want to use in times relation to pictures for synchronization. Um, they can say no. Uh, so then you're kind of stuck if you can't negotiate a license um, to use uh, music, let's say in your film or in a television commercial, uh, or in your music video, or on YouTube. Um, we're gonna, and again, we should put YouTube aside because music is handled a little differently there because there are, there are deals that have been made uh, with YouTube that allow certain things, but somebody is still paying for the use of music and the composers are getting paid, maybe not as much as they would like, but they're getting paid. Um, so I don't want to confuse things too much. What you need to, to understand, because you need to understand the fundamentals here so that when you start talking about licensing, you have a sense of what you're, you're either acquiring or you're giving up when you make a deal regarding your music. So again, synchronization license, music and time relation to pictures, uh, they can be refused. People don't have to grant you a synchronization license. I just want to make a note about production music libraries because there was a time where I had a lot of clients that were signing up with production music uh, libraries. My caution there is, you know, so when you sign up with a production music li library, you are giving them the rights to your music to hopefully market and get your music in film, television, or other uh, audiovisual works um, for a fee. But music production libraries are usually very broad 
libraries. They have a lot of compositions that they control. Um, you have to kind of assess whether or not you're going to get lost in the mix or whether you might be uh, promoted a little bit by the production library. Unfortunately, everything comes down to what the contract says. So you really do need to read the fine print and understand the rights you are giving to the library and what the obligations the library has to you. Okay, so up until now, we've been talking a lot about the composition. Now we're going to take a look at the sound recording because again, we have those two separate copyrights and we have to know that they each have to be handled and they, are, they each are treated to some degree a little bit differently. And then to another degree, they're treated similarly. So the sound recording, sometimes called the master, um, is the recording of a performance of a composition, because we kind of know that. They were first protected in, uh, by copyright in 1972. Um, at that time, they did not have a what we call a performance right. So when, um, when a song was played uh, publicly, a sound recording was played publicly, only the composition owner would get paid. The sound recording copyright owner would not get paid and still does not get paid in a lot of ways. Um, so the performance right for sound recordings are limited. Initially, they were limited to audio only and digital performances. Um, and sorry, now they are, uh, it's been expanded a little bit to um, non-interactive streaming of sound recording. So there's a payment that is made there for a public performance. In 2003, a company known as Sound Exchange came into being, and that handles uh, the licensing and royalty collection for sound recordings. So like you have ASCAP and BMI handling the public performance licensing for the people who create the music and lyrics, Sound Exchange handles similar royalties, although there aren't as many avenues for those royalties through Sound Exchange. So, uh, as we had mentioned, currently there's no performance right for over the air broadcasts for sound recordings. And artists and record labels are not uh, compensated when their creative works are used by traditional radio. Also, there is no sound recording performance right for videos or other visual media. This again is just the US. Sound recordings are treated more favorably outside of the US in some areas, not, not all countries. Okay, just another word on sound exchange. Sound exchange is that as a company, it administers digital performance rights for the use of sound recordings on non-interactive platforms. Um, examples, Sirius, Pandora, iHeartRadio. Uh, this is just a little note as to how Sound Exchange pays um, the fees that it collects, the royalties that it collects, 50% to record companies, 45% to a featured artist, 5% to unions. Just a note to the producers out there. If, if you have a producer contract, for a particular sound recording. And I say that if you have a producer contract, because there's, that means there's evidence that you were a producer on this particular sound recording. You should really explore with sound exchange whether or not you have rights to collect a portion of this income that they distribute. Sound exchange is a very uh, uh, welcoming website with some good information. So if you are a producer and you don't think you're getting the payments that you should be getting uh, or maybe you're wondering if you should be getting payments that you don't know about, I would strongly recommend that you reach out to Sound Exchange. Okay, we are in a world of tech and data. Data has always mattered in the music industry, but it matters more, in my opinion, now than ever. It's all about the codes or it's all about the data, however you want to say it. Songs now have can have codes assigned to them, international codes, so that when a song is being played, it will be, that code will come up and the owner of the copyright, that information will be there. So it's just so much easier to track 
a particular recording or a particular song and make sure that the people that are supposed to get paid get paid. So for the composition, this code is um, an ISWC, International Standard Musical Work Code, that relates to the composition that is automatically assigned when you affiliate as a songwriter with ASCAP or BMI. I do not believe you can get that type of code on your own. I think you have to go through a, a, an organization authorized to distribute those codes, but it's an important code to have for your song. It identifies your song, um, which allows your song to get paid when it gets used. Really important. Um, for sound recordings, it's the International Standard Recording Code. So we know that that relates to sound recordings and that's usually obtained by the record label but also that one can be re, uh, obtained by the independent artist. So I have a little link there, US ISRC. It's not really a link for you, but you can, um, it's, it's US ISRC.org. And if you click on, if you go to that site, you will, um, it will explain how you obtain an ISRC code for your sound recording. So we have become a data-driven society. I think we always were, but now it's kind of more apparent, um, which is it's, it's, it's why it's so important to have your data correctly logged in all the systems from the start. And that really does begin with your copyright registration. It begins with having good data to start with. It begins with knowing who the owners of the copyright are, filling out that, that split sheet when you're collaborating with other people figuring out who owns the rights to the sound recording um, as, you're, as you're making it. So if, I know I'm asking a lot, it's hard to do, it's easy for me to say, but it's so helpful if you can get into a routine there. Um, again, all income streams will flow from the data. Uh, if the data is wrong, it may be difficult to correct down the road, especially if you don't have paperwork that shows some sort of evidence on what was agreed in terms of ownership. Okay, just briefly corralling the data um, for the composition. If you're collaborating, you should have a written agreement. If not, try to get a split sheet in there somewhere. If you're the main songwriter in a band, you should have a written agreement with the other band members as to who's gonna own the songs. You should figure that out early on if you can. Um, you're going to register the work for copy, co with, you're going to register the work for copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office, and you're going to affiliate with ASCAP or BMI because they're going to assign you that code for each of your songs, um, which is important. For corralling the data for sound recordings, again, it'd be great if you had some some sort of paperwork when you when you make your sound recordings, whether it's a split sheet where if you're going to have more than one owner, or it's work for hire agreements for all the people who contribute to the song. Uh, you're gonna register the work for copyright as well. You on your own, if you're independent, you're going to get the recording code, the ISRC for each sound recording, and you're gonna register with sound, with sound Exchange to make sure that you get paid on the, on the public performance, even though they're limited of those sound recordings. So um, now that we know or have a sense, hopefully, of how all the different rights come into play with the composition and with the sound recording. Now we can talk a little bit about sampling. What is sampling? Sampling refers to the practice of lifting portions of an existing recording and using this lifted sample, usually in a repetitive manner, manner as a component of a new song. Sampling uh, kind of had always been about sound recordings. Um, the first important legal decision on sampling, the case decision starts out with the words, thou shalt not steal. Um, that was back in 1991, where Biz Markey used a portion of the song Alone Again Naturally, which was written by, uh, Gil written and recorded by Gilbert O'Sullivan. Um, and Biz Markey did so without permission. And the court, said, nope, you, you, you don't get to steal. You don't get to steal someone else's work and put it in your own. That has not really changed. So the, the legal perspective has not really changed. 
Uh, it's not a matter of, you know, three notes are okay <laughs> or eight notes are okay. Um, from a pure legal perspective, thou shalt not steal. Um, so sampling without permission may not only implicate the sound recording, when you, where you lift a portion of the sound recording and put that into your song, it can also implicate the composition because now you're lifting a piece of not only the sound recording, but a piece of a song that someone else, that belongs to someone else that they wrote. So that phrase or that melody, you're lifting that too. So you're, you're infringing on both of the copyrights, quite possibly. Uh, which is, you know, can be a costly error. Um, so while sampling, it's sort of repeating what I just was talking about, while sampling is generally thought of as lifting a segment of a sound recording, it also comes into play when you're taking a segment of a composition and you're creating your, your own sound recording. When you take a piece of a composition and include it into your new work, that's often referred to as an interpolation. So for example, I want to record just the chorus of Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. And I want to use just that chorus in my new song. And maybe that chorus that I take is only gonna be a small portion of that new song. Um, I have sampled, let's say I take it from, from, her, from her recording of that song, now that's, probably still owned by Big Machine, although I think she is going to end up re-recording it and releasing it. Um, but I have sampled the composition. So even if, so I'm re-recording it, so I'm not using her recording. If I just re-record the chorus of Shake It Off by Taylor Swift and put that in my new song, I am uh, sampling, in a sense, um, her composition. So sampling in, in my mind is broader than just the, the using the, lifting the sound recording. So sampling, there's good news and there's bad news. <laughs> so the bad news is that sampling without permission is copyright infringement. It just is. And again, from a legal perspective, consequences can be money damage as money damages and injunctive relief, meaning they can stop you from using your music. That includes the sample. So you don't get to use your work anymore because there's a sample in it that you didn't clear. Um, relying on a fair use defense uh, is going to be very, very costly and, and more so costly if you, if you lose on that defense. So let me just play that out for a second. Uh, if you use, if you sample without permission, it's copyright infringement. So there's a claim. The, the copyright owner can make a claim against you for using something without permission. Now, in defending that claim, you may say, well, I have, I can rely on the defense of fair, something called fair use. I'm sure you've heard that word before or those two words before. To try and get into what's fair use and what's not fair use, that would be at least another three or four sessions <laughs> to discuss that fully. So we, we, well, we can't go into that here. I... I strongly do not recommend people using samples without permission and then down the road, we're going to call it fair use. You've, you've really got to think that one through and you probably should do it with the benefit of uh, legal counsel. Um, the best path is to obtain a license for the sample. That truly is the best path. So that's still, you know, in my bad news category, but the good news is Clearing samples is easier than ever, in my opinion. Everybody knows that that's what should be done. Um, when you honor someone else's material by including it in your work, sometimes that's a real feel-good thing. And if you, if you can present it in such a way where you are honoring them and using their work, people are, people are human. They're more inclined to work with you on a reasonable uh, cost for the sample. The other news about Sampling, so there's the good news, the bad news, and the other news. The other news is sampling, clearing sample does cost money um, and possibly a share in the copyright of the new work. Um, I do have to say too, a request for sample clearance may be refused. Again, the copyright holder doesn't have to agree to let you use their work 
as a, a, you know, to sample their work. Um, I don't get any uh, uh, promotional remuneration for this, uh, but I do need to give a shout out to Deborah Manis Gardner. She runs DMG Clearances, and I think she's terrific. Uh, she really knows what she's doing. She's uh, artist friendly, artist who use sampling a lot. She's very artist friendly. So if you look up um, DMG Clearances online, you will find her site and she's worth a call. Uh, if you're stuck, you know, using samples and you really, you do want to try and license it, um, she's probably the right person to start with. Um, okay, so winding up here, um, the part you've all been thinking about is sampling. Okay, so it gets a little tricky when a portion of an existing sound recording is lifted and then you change it so much so that it's unrecognizable with respect to the original. Do you still have to clear it? As a lawyer, I have to say yes. Um, in practice, uh, what I've what I think we've laid out today is technically it is still copyright infringement and you need a license. So I think my guidance is today, after all that we've talked about and the different rights and, and what happens with infringement, and you know, you can be sued for copyright infringement and all that other stuff, but you just need to understand the risks. Um, so that concludes this session. Thank you very much for uh, your, your attention and thank you, IMSTA, and um, be well, everyone, and uh, good luck with sampling and, and music in general. Take care.